of you have a copy of the Word with you this evening. If you do, go ahead and turn with me to John chapter... I'm sorry, let's go to 1 Corinthians. We'll, we'll start there. We're going to move around a good bit this evening. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is where we're going to kind of focus our starting point and move from there. We've been uh, looking at uh, the ministry, the, the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, last week, talking about the filling of... Of the Holy Spirit. Prayerfully, uh, this week you have been more mindful uh, of of just depending upon the Holy Spirit uh, to lead, uh, to guide, to direct uh, your life day to day. Uh, but let's uh, let's do this. Uh, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get into the Word of God together this evening. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before you tonight, we uh, will we come humbly. In your presence, acknowledging our need, our weakness, Lord, apart from you, we can do nothing. And Lord, we are a needy people, most needful of your grace. We are needy, Lord, needful of your spirit to work in our heart and our life, that we might be conformed more to the image of your dear son, that we would be the people that you have called us to be. I thank you for this time that we can come together as brothers and sisters and uh, just to bear one another's burdens, a a time where we can uh, make our requests known to one another and and bring them before your throne of grace where we find help in time of need. Lord, we think of of those that we mentioned this evening. Uh, Lord, we think of Carrie. Uh, Lord, just what a struggle that's been to be uh, on bed rest for so long. And Lord, I pray you just encourage her, uh, strengthen her, continue to be with the baby and uh, Lord, we uh, just uh, trust you in it all, and uh, be with Carol, Lord. I pray that you would um, comfort her as only you can. And uh, Father, we do pray for healing. Uh, Lord, we know that all healing comes from you, and so we look to you tonight and ask that you would uh, do mighty things for your good name. And, uh, Lord, just continue to uphold and sustain her. And Lord, we think of Dottie awaiting her surgery. We pray this be helpful for her. And, uh, Lord, so many others tonight that were mentioned. Uh, we think of the those who are in the hospital and uh, or those who are home and, and are not able to be out. Uh, but Father, we pray that you would work through these things to draw each one closer to you, uh, that you might um, use uh, these situations uh, as a testimony of your faithfulness and Lord, you might draw others to yourself. And so we just ask now that you would be with us here as we come before your word. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see what you would have for us tonight. May we be a people characterized by by your spirit. May the fruit of the spirit be evident in our life. Lord, may we just continually be conformed to the image of Christ. We pray and ask all these things in the name of Jesus and amen. Well, we're just going to do this a couple more weeks, but as we focus in on, on the person and work of the Holy Spirit, we're reminded of the dramatic effect that the spirit has in the life of the believer. Uh, and I don't want you to discount that. Let me just remind you of those passages again. We'll, we'll get to 1 Corinthians here, but you know, John 16, 7, Jesus told his disciples, it's to your advantage that I go away. Right? It's better for you that I leave, that I can send the helper to you. Right? That's the, the Holy Spirit, the comforter. He's, he's our help. Right? And then over in chapter 14, in verse 16, he says, I will ask the Father, he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Now those are, those are exciting words. Those are new words, right? Jesus is getting ready to leave. He's on his way to the cross. And you'll notice in, in, in chapters 14 through 16 of the Gospel of John, much of his focus is on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He's preparing to leave. And, and, and the disciples are crushed. They're, they're filled with sorrow. And yet, his encouragement to them is, even though I'm leaving, I'm sending my spirit. And, and, and he's going to be a help and a comfort. Not only is he going to be a help and a comfort, but he's going to be in you. He's, that, those are new words, right? There's, there's not, Jesus had never said anything quite like that before. And the reality that we have looked at over the course of the last few weeks is the, the Spirit, which is God, indwells His people. Right, so look at 1 Corinthians 6 here. Familiar, familiar territory for most of you, right? Verse 19, 
let me, let me just backtrack a little bit. Let me go back to verse 15. It says, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but a sexually immoral person sin sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Those are powerful words, right? In light of the, the temptation and the sin that we see that, that exists here in the church at Corinth, he says, let me remind you that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit that is in you. <laughs> the Holy Spirit here creates a home in the believer. Let that sink in just a moment. The Spirit of God that was, <laughs> that was at creation's birth, right? Right? We see the Spirit involved in the very creation of the universe. This triune God now indwells His people. Now, this fulfills the promise of God. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And at at the same time, this reality means that all that God has called us to, He empowers us to do. The ability to live for Christ comes as a result of the indwelling Holy Spirit in your life. In fact, when you examine the life of Christ himself, he was dependent upon the the ministry and the work of the Spirit for his his work. And, And we don't have time to trace that out tonight. But following that example, we too depend upon the Spirit of God. That very thought, that thought alone, should transform us. God in me. I've I've quoted from this book the last few weeks. I'll do it again. Francis Chan's Forgotten God. He says, if it's true that the Spirit of God dwells in us and that our bodies are the Holy Spirit's temple, then shouldn't there be a huge difference between the person who has the Spirit of God living inside of him or her and the person who does not? How, How true that is. Should the people of God who have the Spirit of God living in them, should they not be different than those who don't? It should be evident. This reality means that we are not our own. The Spirit of God makes a home in you, but the Spirit of God takes possession, right? He says, you're not your own. You were bought with a price. And when the Holy Spirit takes residence in your life, He's taking ownership. Right? He says, you're mine. His his presence is evident that that you belong to God. You're his. Now, now what's that mean? Your, Your body and your spirit. That means that all you have and all you are belong to him. So the the reality, the truth that the Holy Spirit makes a home in your life means that your time is His. Your your treasures are His. Your talents are His. Your temple, your body is His, right? Your tongue is His. Every part of you belongs to the Spirit of God and therefore is to be used for the glory of God. Now that causes us to pause and ask, right? What areas of my life do I need to yield to the Spirit? Am I I yielded to the Spirit's working in my life? (laughs) In my body? With my mouth? (laughs) With my, 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 my gifts, my talents, my abilities? With my finances, with my material possessions? With my time? It's all His. So we have the Spirit of God who, who makes, uh, and, and what an incredible reality. What a comfort, right? When the helper, when the comforter comes, you have, you have the special promise as the people of God. 
no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're dealing with, no matter what you're going with, he is with you. He's with you. And he's in you. And he enables you. But at the same time, right, there's this comfort, right? There's this reality of the comfort and the help of the Spirit. But when the Spirit of God makes a home, when he creates a home in your life, <laughs> the Holy Spirit's going to clean house. Right? And that's what we want to focus on. You know, the, the reality that the Spirit of God living in you means that he's going to clean you up. Right? <laughs> you think about this, the condition, the state you are when you come to Christ. You're lost, right? Your, your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, right? Sons of disobedience. We're a mess. And now the Spirit of God takes up residence in us. And there's a positional way in which we are justified and sanctified. But the reality is that we still live in this flesh. And there's this battle with sin that's ongoing, right? In Galatians 5.16, the, the flesh is warring against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. And so the reality that the Spirit of God indwelling you means that He's going to do a work in you to clean you up. Let me, let me show you 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter 1, 2. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood. Right, so there he talks about the sanctification of of the Spirit, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, verses 13 and 14. He says, But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here he talks about the sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience to Christ. And there he says, your sanctification by the Spirit for the glory of Christ. Right? That you may obtain that glory. So the Spirit of God is working in our life for the process, the purpose of sanctification. Now some of you are going, what in the heck is that? You know, sanctification simply means to be set apart. To be made holy. It has the idea of being set apart from Sin to God. And, and the reality is, is this is a continual process, right? We call this progressive sanctification, right? This is an ongoing, right? This, this house cleaning is continually happening to the point where one day, ultimately, we will be like Christ, right? So 2 Corinthians 3.18 it says, we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. What's the role of the Spirit? This transformation, right? The, the primary agent in our sanctification is the Spirit of God that indwells us. <laughs> he makes a home, right? Creates a home in us, but then he's going to clean house. Right? That's the picture that we see from the Spirit. This is the will of God. Right? We, we looked last week at Ephesians 5. Right? Do not be unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Well, what's the will of God? According to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 3, the will of God is your sanctification. That's God's will. <laughs> we don't have to be you know, guessing and wondering, we're told very clearly that God wants us to be holy, set apart from sin. And, and so there's this lifelong process that unfolds for the people of God where we are being made more like Christ. The Holy Spirit is making us holy. You know, that's really good news, right? Because we're not holy. And, and, and according to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, we're to pursue holiness because without holiness, we will not see God. It's impossible for us to see him, to know him, to experience him apart from holiness that is made possible through his spirit. So the indwelling of the Holy Spirit means that we're to live holy lives. 
So we have this comfort, this helper that in, it indwells us and it enables us and empowers us. But at the same time, there's a work that's happening in the people of God. Or at least there should be, right? The reality of the Spirit of God lives in you should mean that you're different than the person who does not have the Spirit. We should be set apart. Living holy lives. First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 7. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Why does he give us his Spirit? That we would pursue holiness. That we would be set apart. He calls us away from this life of sin and calls us to be conformed more to the image of Christ. And, and the one who calls us to holiness, enables us to live that way. We see the standards, we open up the scriptures sometimes, we see those standards, we say, I can never do that, I can never live like that. God has given us all that we need for life and for godliness. We've been enabled, empowered by the Spirit of God to live holy lives. You know, I I think about the reality of the Spirit of God indwelling us as, as a temple. And, and, I, and my mind immediately runs back to John chapter 2 when Jesus entered the temple. You, you remember he, he walked into the temple and he looked around and he was angry. And, and he was zealous for God's holiness. And he just cleaned the temple out, right? He just kicked out the money chambers, chambers turned over the tables. He said, this is my father's house. I wonder... I wonder what he would do if he, if he stepped in. You know, j- just that visual picture of, of Jesus stepping into your life, stepping into your heart, looking into your mind. What would he see? What would he say as he entered into the temple? Oh, are there things there that he would need to toss out that would fill him with anger, that would make him zealous for the holiness of his Father? The, the Spirit of God indwelling us means that there's going to be times where we clash. We clash with our flesh and we clash with the world, right? We cl- and, and so there's this ongoing <laughs> battle that's raging inside of us. Now, one of the primary ways in which the Spirit accomplishes this purpose is that the Spirit convicts our heart. This, this, is, a, this is one of the roles of the, of the Spirit of God is, is conviction. Right? Now, I'm going to go back to John chapter 16. Now in John 16, we see see this ministry, but it's geared primarily towards unbelievers, right? In John 16, again, Jesus preparing his disciples for when he leaves. He's saying, you know, they hated me. They're going to hate you too. They're going to kill you. They're going to put you in prison, right? And he's just preparing them for what's ahead. And in verse 8, he says, and when he comes, that's the spirit, he will convict the world concerning sin and and righteousness, and judgment. So when the Spirit of God comes, He's going to convict. And, and that, that's a legal courtroom type of term here. It has the idea of, of convincing of the truth, exposing the facts. It's just, you could picture the, the prosecuting attorney laying out the evidence and piling it up to the point where the judge simply has no choice but to say, guilty. In fact, the idea is, is that even the defendant who recognizes what? I'm guilty. I'm guilty. He, the, the Holy Spirit is convicting the world of sin. This is one of the primary roles of the Spirit, particularly among unbelievers. This is why we share the gospel. This is why we, we share the word, because through the word, God convicts, he convicts the world of sin. Sin is transgression of the law. The primary sin in which he convicts them of is what? (laughs) Look at verse 8. He says, he will convict the world concerning sin. Verse 9, concerning sin. Why? Because they do not believe in me. The the primary sin in which the Spirit is convicting is that of unbelief. Unbelief in Jesus Christ. The whole purpose behind the Gospel of John is that they would believe that he is the Son of God and, and believing they would have life. And so the Spirit of God convicts that men will see their need of Christ and believe. 
So we see this convicting work of the Spirit of God, not only of sin, but also of righteousness. <laughs> now, why righteousness? He says, because I go, verse 10, because I go to the Father, and you'll see me no longer, right? <laughs> he is the perfect picture of righteousness. And because he's no longer there, he's going to convict the world of righteousness. And, and our problem is what? We're very self-righteous. <laughs> we, we tend to think we have no sin, or I'm not that bad. And so the Spirit of God opens our eyes to see that we're not all that, that we are not what God has called us. We do not meet the standard. We, we do fall short, and the, and the Holy Spirit is at work in seeing our sin and seeing how far short we fall, and then ultimately revealing, right, concerning judgment, verse 11, because the ruler of this world is judged. <laughs> What, what we see here is Satan, the prince, the power of the air, has been judged, right? At the cross, that, that work was laid out to where he, he crushed the serpent's head. And, and the reality of that judgment means that all, all who are of their father, the devil, will experience that judgment. All who fall short of the glory of God and fail to turn in faith and repentance to the Lord Jesus Christ will fall under the wrath of God. And the Spirit of God works to accomplish that purpose, right? To, to, to allow men to see their sin, to allow them to see their, their unrighteousness and the judgment that is coming. That's all a work of the Spirit. And, and this is primarily geared towards unbelievers, right? This is encouragement to disciples as they're being sent out on mission into the world. <laughs> he says the Spirit of God is going to do a work that you can't do. The Spirit has the ability to open men's eyes to see the beauty and the glory of Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that the Spirit ceases this convicting work when, when believers come to Him, right? When we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and the Spirit of God is indwelling us, it's a different kind of conviction, right? No longer being convicted of the wrath of God, right? We're not, we're not going to pay the penalty for our sin, and yet... That conviction is, is designed what? To grow us, right? To sanctify us, to, to set us apart more <laughs> to be like Christ. Right? So the, the Holy Spirit's conviction comes to help us now, moving us away from sin and closer to Christ. So yes, the, the Spirit is still convicting, still working in the life of the believer, but the purpose is for sanctification now, for spiritual growth. Um, you ever, you ever felt that? You ever felt that? You, you're doing something, and you know you shouldn't be doing it? Yeah, I, 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 it, I understand, right? We have a conscience, right? We have a conscience. All, all men have a conscience, right? But our consciences are not, they're not sound. They're not sure, right? Our conscience can be seared, right? They can be skewed, right? But the Spirit of God is always true. Always true. He is the Spirit of truth. So when the Spirit of God is at work in convicting our hearts, I, I, I got to jump back to the Old Testament. I, I just think David is a great example. We know, we know in this moment that the Spirit of God is on him because he asks, Lord, please don't take him from me. Right? In Psalm 51, we see the work of the Spirit. Again, we looked at this last week. Right? This is, the, this is David after his sin with, with um, Bathsheba and his murder of Uriah. It's his prayer of confession. But in verse, in verse 3, he says, I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. The Spirit of God indwelling us enables us to recognize our sinfulness. And for lack of a better way, the sinfulness of our sin. That we have sinned against God and Him alone first and foremost. You say, what does that look like? Well, Psalm 32 tells us what it looks like. Right? We, we get the confession here. He says, I've sinned against you, Lord. But before that confession came, we see, we see David's heart. We see, we see what he's experiencing here. In verse 3, it says, for when I kept silent, I refused to confess. I refused to be open about my sin. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away 
through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. You see the, the effect of sin in David's life? He, was, he said, I, I, felt, I felt that God was, his hand was heavy upon me. That's the spirit of God at work. In David's life, bringing him to the point of confession. Now, I trust that you have experienced that. And if you've never experienced the conviction of the Holy Spirit, then you don't have the Spirit of God in you because you do not yet know Jesus Christ. Yeah. If we have this Spirit in us, then when we're walking out of line, out of step with the Spirit, then we're going to know that. Now, we can ignore that. We can quench the Spirit, right? <laughs> we can grieve the Spirit of God by our sin. But the Spirit of God is going to be there. He doesn't leave us, right? He, he, he never leaves us. And so that, that constant, it, how this should move us to holiness, the, the very fact that the Spirit of God is in you, it promotes purity. If I'm conscious, if I'm conscious of the Spirit's indwelling, in presence, I'm much less likely to do something that I know I should not do. I, I mean, it, it's really simple, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> you know, whenever mom and dad are going, the kids are much likely to do things they shouldn't do, right? If you're aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit, it promotes holiness, promotes purity. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't say, I'm going to do what I want to do, because you can, right? You can. You know, and we've all done that at times, right? Before, before, you ever, before you ever go through that door, you walk into that sin, you feel the Spirit, <laughs> and you still do it, right? Because that flesh is warring against the Spirit, and, and we can give in to that at any moment. But we see here that the conviction of the Spirit of God, how does he do that? Well, primarily the Spirit of God works through the Word of God. Now, if, if I go back to John 16, we started there. John 16 and verse 13, Jesus said, When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears He will speak, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. Now, that's talking about the Spirit's work with the disciples in, in giving us His Word. So, the Spirit is going to speak all truth, and He's, he's, he's going to give us this word that we can live by. So, the Spirit of God primarily works through the Word of God to bring about this conviction. How do we, Paul said, how would I have known sin if it were not for the law? Sin is transgression of the law. So, as, as I'm in the Word of God, the Spirit of God takes His Word and applies it to my heart and life. To where I can know, right? The, the better I know this word, the better equipped I am <laughs> for the sanctification process. For the Spirit of God to do His work in my heart and life. Now that, that word, man, that, that comes in lots of ways, right? From personal reading, <laughs> uh, you know, from, from Bible study, from, from the preaching of the word of God. In fact, some of the most powerful ways in which we see the, the Spirit of God working through His Word is when it is preached, when we open up the Scriptures. You know, the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 5, he said, because our gospel came to you, not only in Word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. So the preaching of the gospel went forth in the power of the Holy Spirit and it produced conviction in the hearers. We, we see the same thing in Acts chapter 2 when Peter was preaching at Pentecost. And he began to preach <laughs> and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. What happened? It says they were cut to their heart. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Has the Spirit of God ever just cut you to the heart? As you, were, as you were hearing the word of God or as you were reading the word of God? I know. I know that I am nothing but an unworthy servant. I'm... <laughs> My ability to lead and to pastor you is, is, I'm inadequate for that task. But this word and the spirit is more than adequate. And so, 
make use of the means of grace that God has given to equip you to live the life that he's called you to live. Place yourself under the preaching of the word of God, not because you've got a great preacher, but because you have a great word and you have a Holy Spirit who works through that word. Allow the spirit of God to work in you. We could run with this for a while. You know, God has called us to live, right? Be holy as I am holy. We look at that sometimes, we just kind of dismiss it. Well, I can't be, I can't be holy. <laughs> you have the Spirit of God in you. And so as we're walking in the Spirit, we can live in holiness. Now, anytime, right, anytime we are sinning, we're walking out of step with the Spirit. So the Spirit of God convicts us, and we respond. We respond quickly to that conviction with confession. And he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us. Why? Because of the work of Christ. Let us live lives empowered by the Holy Spirit, filled with the Spirit, that he may be glorified. It's possible that you're here tonight and you've never, you've never experienced what we're talking about. The, the work of the Spirit in your life. Yeah, I know. You can, spirit, you can experience guilt. You can experience conviction. You can have a guilty conscience. But all oh, the work of the Spirit <laughs> to the point where we saw in John 16 where he convicts you of sin and of righteousness and judgment. And you see your need and you come to Christ. That's a work that only he can do. And if you've never experienced that, then why not respond to the leading of the Spirit tonight and call on the Lord Jesus Christ to save you from your sin? If you do that, please talk to someone. We would love to help you in your walk with Christ. But we're going to close in prayer tonight. And if I can be of help to you in any way, please don't hesitate to see me. Father, we thank you for your word, for its power. I pray that you would be with us as we leave this place. Each one, Lord, you know them, you know their heart, you know their mind. I pray that we as your people would be filled with your spirit. Walking daily in dependence upon you, knowing that apart from you, we can do nothing. May we grow in holiness and grace. Father, at a time where our nation is clearly divided and people are hurt, I pray that we would be a people of peace. That your spirit would would move mightily in us. They might see your love, your joy, your peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. It's not in us. It comes from you, Lord. So I pray that you would do that work, that you might be glorified. We ask it all in Jesus' name, and amen. Have a good night.